to this point, we've built pretty much all of the fundamentals we need to build something a lot more interesting. So we've built an SR flip-flop, we've built a D flip-flop, an edge-triggered D flip-flop, we've built a half adder, a full adder, and we've built pretty much all of the logic gates that we're going to need to build something really exciting out of vacuum tubes. And the ultimate goal, for me at least, is to build a vacuum tube computer. Right? I mean, vacuum tube computers used to be the size of buildings, so one guy in a small room? How hard can it be, right? Uh, well. Well, obviously it's not all gonna happen today, but that's what I wanna get started on. So let's hop over to the bench and take a look at my plan. So the first step in building our vacuum tube computer is coming up with a type of processor architecture that's gonna work for us. And I'm not smart enough to just create a processor architecture from scratch, uh, but I am smart enough to Google different architectures and steal those. Fortunately, when you Google 8-bit processor, the first one that comes up is this architecture, which is the SAP-1. And SAP stands for simple as possible. And well, I quite like that. I'd like to keep it as simple as possible. And actually, this is not the first time I've seen this architecture. Uh, I was introduced to this architecture through Ben Eater and his videos on essentially building exactly this, an 8-bit processor out of 7400 series uh, TTL chips. And what a fantastic series. If you have not watched Ben Eater's videos, stop watching this right now and go watch his stuff. They're brilliant and he's been a massive inspiration. So you can see there's quite a lot going on here. We've got a program counter, we've got uh, our input and memory address register, we've got some RAM built in, we've got an instruction register, uh, we've got two registers for doing arithmetic on, and then we have the arithmetic unit here, which is really just an adder and subtractor. Uh, and in the simple as possible unit, this actually doesn't have any uh, logic functionality, so you can't do AND or OR, any of that through that. It's just a simple adder and subtractor. And then we have an output register and we have a display. And this is all on a 8-bit wide uh, data bus here, so we have 8 bits moving back and forth here. So I'm looking at this and I'm starting to realize this is huge. This is massive. So if we just try to figure out these three, let's just take these three, because that's gonna be the easiest to figure out. So each register is made up of D flip-flops, and uh, there's gonna be eight D flip-flops in each register. So uh, we know that if we build this out of six AU6s, we can build a edge-triggered D flip-flop using six vacuum tubes. So six times eight is 48, and we have another 48 down here. And we'll uh, but, but it's not just that. We, ha we have to be able to control when data's coming into this register, uh, when data's leaving this register, we have to be able to control when data's leaving this as well. So the easiest way to do that is with just an army of AND gates. And so uh, each AND gate is going to take two, two vacuum tubes, and so that's going to be another 16 on this. And well, we're, we're rapidly approaching math that I'm having a hard time keeping track of in my head. Uh, so let me just pull out my calculator here. So we know that we have six tubes per D flip-flop, and there's eight D flip-flops per register. That's 48, and then there's two registers, so we'll double that. So that's, uh, that's up to 96. Uh, and then if we have uh, 16 AND gates for each register to kind of control when they're, when they're putting information out, that's going to be plus uh, 16 plus another 16. Okay, so that's 128 just for those two. Uh, and then the adder and subtractor, we, we can make a one-bit full adder using eight vacuum tubes. And there's, uh, well, there's, there's eight bits, so uh, eight times eight. Let's go eight times eight equals 64 plus 128. Uh, okay, so that's 192. And then we've got another uh, 16 AND gates to put our data onto the bus here. So... Okay, we're over, we're over 200 vacuum tubes just for these three. All right, so there comes a point in projects sometimes where you take a realization that maybe you bit off more than you could chew. And I think trying to build a vacuum tube SAP-1 CPU is the very definition of biting off more than we can chew. So we need to take a look at something a little simpler. So my first thought was dropping down to four bits, just having the bus width. Uh, so I started Googling and I started looking around at, you know, four bit architectures. Uh, and, there, you know, there was the, the Intel 4004 
and the TMS 100, I believe, uh, that were four bit architectures, but even then those are extremely complicated. So on a whim, I Googled one bit architectures and there's not really any examples of a one bit architecture out there, except for one interesting little chip. And that is this little guy right here. I was so interested in it, I actually bought a couple off of eBay. And so uh, what is this chip you ask? Well, this is a Motorola MC14500B. Now it's listed as an industrial control unit, but if we read just the very first sentence here, it says the MC14500B industrial control unit is a single bit CMOS processor. Now that's what I'm talking about. Now we're on the right page. We have something that is a processor and we're all the way down to a one bit data bus. So this sounds like something that might be doable. Now this chip in and of itself has, you can see right off the bat, 16 instructions and it can run up to one megahertz. I do not expect that level of speed if we were to build this out of vacuum tubes, but that's pretty impressive. Uh, seems to be a pretty interesting, capable little chip. And you can see we have a little block diagram down here. And this is a little small, so I redrew it a little bigger so we could get a better look at it. Now compared to the SAP-1, it looks dramatically different. But if we start breaking it down into its individual components, it's pretty simple actually. There's, uh, the heart of it is this logic unit right here in the center. And interestingly, it's a logic unit, not an arithmetic logic unit, just a logic unit. So it doesn't actually, it's not capable of doing any math. It's just logic and or exclusive nor. Uh, and then there's three D flip-flops that we can see right off the bat. There's one here, here, and here. And these two D flip-flops on the top are just flip-flops that control uh, input and output. So we have to put these D flip-flops on to enable data to come off of the one bit data bus, which is this line right up here at the top. Uh, so this input D flip-flop has to be on to go into this AND gate to allow data from this data bus to make it into the logic unit. And then conversely, this one is for output. So this D flip flop has to be on to enable uh, data to make it to the right pin out this way. Now the logic unit takes two inputs and gives a single output. And that single output goes into this D flip flop down here, which is called the results register. Now the results register also doubles as an input register for the logic unit. So whatever's in the results register is going back around into the logic unit. So whatever the, the logic unit does logic on data and what's in the results register, and then it saves the result of that back into the results register. So it's a, a pretty interesting way to handle it, but it makes it extremely compact, which is very nice. And then over here, this is probably the most intense part of the entire uh, chip. And this is the instruction register. So it saves a four bit instruction. Uh, so you can have up to 16 instructions. And so that's what we saw earlier. And speaking of those instructions, let's take a look at those right quick. So this is the instruction set. And there's some pretty interesting stuff going on here. We can ignore the first and last instructions because there are no operations. Uh, but we can load data from the, the data bus into the result register. We can uh, and the data bus and the result register. We can or the data bus and the result register. We can do an exclusive nor on the result register and the data bus. Uh, and for uh, load and an or, we can do that with the data bus inverted as well. So uh, these operations through the logic unit give us a whole lot of interesting flexibility. And we have to really kind of wrap our mind around doing weird stuff with, with this. Now, once the fourth bit here changes to a one, we're not working with the logic unit anymore. We're now working with the rest of the chip. So we can uh, output or we can output the result register, or output the, the complement of the result register, the inverted result register through the right pin. Uh, these are the input and output enables. And then we have a couple generic flags. So we can set a jump flag, a return flag, or a skip next instruction flag. So that's, that's the 16 instructions that we have. And through these 16 instructions, we, we can actually achieve quite a lot, despite the fact that the, the processor is only a single bit.
Now, if we compare this to the SAP-1 that we were looking at earlier, so this one right here, if we compare this to the SAP-1, we'll notice that we're missing quite a lot. So uh, we're essentially missing uh, pretty much this entire half with the exception of the instruction register here. And so that makes some interesting things. The program counter is not included. The memory address register is not included. Uh, and these are probably going to be the two biggest ones that we're going to notice missing. I mean, you can see that on this, this architecture diagram here, they're, they're not anywhere to be included. Now, by offloading the program counter, that creates an interesting way. It, it, it seems like the, the processor here is going to be extremely limited. But what it means is that this processor can work with whatever program counter you build. And that gives us extreme flexibility in building however long of a program counter we want or whatever kind of program counter we want. So looking towards the future, I really like this idea of, of building modular parts that we can build onto it and expand from there. So I'm really excited about this processor. But it's still not a small undertaking to build this with vacuum tubes. And as a matter of fact, I've gone through and tried to recreate the chip as best as I can at the logic level, which is what uh, this mess of lines is. And I've, I've built it primarily out of NOR gates because that's gonna be the easiest thing for us to build. But I mean, you can see right now, this is a, a nightmare and a headache and it's, it's insane, but I think it's doable. So we're gonna go into a lot of detail in this in the future as we build it. But as with any big project, and make no mistake, this is a massive project, I like to build a proof of concept first. And building a proof of concept of something like this, something that's already as simple as it is, I mean, despite the apparent complexity, uh, is kind of difficult. So we need to kind of take a look at what all we can eliminate. Uh, so the proof of concept that I want to build, I don't really need the, the instruction register because I'm just going to have some switches, I think, operating that. So we can just eliminate all of this right off the bat. For the logic unit, I'm going to pare this down just a little bit. So uh, right now it takes uh, four different inputs to select different things through this kind of multiplexer logic setup here. And I'm going to drop that down to three inputs to make that a little simpler. But we will keep the logic unit and we will keep the result register, which is this D flip flop right here. Uh, but I don't think we need the input register and we don't need the output register, so we can eliminate those. Uh, and this extra D register down here is for skipping instructions. And since we're not gonna be running a program counter on this proof of concept thing, I think we can go ahead and eliminate that as well. So after working on this for a while, I kind of came up with this. This is our proof of concept. This is the first thing we're gonna build. So this is much more digestible. And so essentially we have uh, a three bit input here. And so we can select this. This is kind of like selecting our instruction. Uh, and then that instruction is purely for the logic unit, which is going to be these four NOR gates here. And then we have our data coming in and our data also has an inverter on it to help with the logic. And then we have our clock coming in over here for the D flip-flop. And this is our uh, six NOR gate D flip-flop that we've, we've built in previous episodes. And really, that's it. That's really, really simple. I, I like this. This is something that's going to answer some questions and help us get on the right path. Like, for example, how does the logic unit work? And how does the logic unit interact with the D flip-flop? And so this is our proof of concept. This is what we're going to start building starting in the next episode. But trying to rebuild this processor from scratch is very difficult if you don't actually understand how the processor itself is functioning. So I've actually taken it and I put it on a breadboard so that way I can start tinkering around with it and experimenting with it and, and maybe figure out a little more about how this processor works exactly. And that should hopefully make it easier to build our ultimate one through NOR gates. So let's take a look at that breadboard right quick. All right, so here's our breadboard setup, and I've got these four switches over here to represent the instructions that are going into the instruction register. We've got our data switch down here. We've got our clock. Um, and so that data switch will turn on this green LED and the clock will turn on this blue LED. And then here's our chip. This is the MC14500. And this green LED over here is going to be whatever's in the result register. These are the four generic flags that we have that we can access through these commands down here. And then this uh, yellow one over here is the 
right. So this is our, our kind of our data out. And so we'll reset the CPU. That's what this button up here does. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to set the input D flip-flop and the output D flip-flop to one. And so that's, uh, if we look here, that's 1010 and 1011. So 1010, and we need to set our data to one. And then we toggle the clock. And then we go 1011 and then we toggle the clock. And then to make sure that it's working, let's just go ahead and load uh, our data, which is going to be one, into the result register, which is 0001. So put you guys at zero, and that's one. And so let's toggle the clock. Yep, there we go. We can see that we have a, a one in our result register here. That's awesome. And so if we turn our data off, and we, we can do a lot of interesting things with it, but the most interesting one that I can demonstrate here is the exclusive NOR. And so the way the exclusive NOR works is that uh, if the result register and the data are the same, the output is going to be one. But if the result register and the data are different, the output's gonna be zero. And so right now the result register is one, the data is zero. So if we do an XNOR on this, the output should go to zero. So See, XNOR is going to be 0, 1, 1, 1. So we'll do 0, 1, 1, 1. Uh, and so if we hit the clock, we should see that turn off. Nope, that's because I must have input something incorrectly here. There it goes. Okay, so maybe one of these wasn't making good connection. Or maybe I had some bounce on my little clock here. Uh, but anyway, so now our result register is zero and our data is zero. So if I hit the clock again, the output should become one. There we go. And so in this way, we've kind of created a uh, divide by two. That's really interesting. That's an exclusive NOR acting there. So let's see if we can turn one of these flags on. And if we look, uh, if we do just zero, 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 that's a no operation. And whatever's in the result register stays in the result register, but one of our flags will turn on. So let's, let's give that a shot. Let's just change all of these to zero, hit our clock. Yeah, there we go, that's one of our flags. Now, if we do the other no operation, which is uh, again, no change in the register, but we get a different flag. So let's try that. That's one, 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 one. And so if we hit the clock, yeah, there we go. We got our other flag. All right, finally, let's, uh, let's load some data into the result register. So we'll just put a one into the result register. And then let's see if we can output this one onto our write pin over here. And if we look, that's going to be STO here, which is going to be essentially one, zero, zero, zero. So set you to one, and then we'll bring these back down to zero. Now, when I hit the clock, we should see this light up. Awesome. Oh, but interesting, it only stays illuminated while the clock is being depressed. That's really interesting. And that's something that I would not have been able to figure out just by looking at the data sheet. So by actually having the, the actual chip here in my hands allows me to experiment with all of these different instructions and see how they react and what changes. And, and that gives me better insight into building this with, with vacuum tubes. And so I'm, I'm really excited about this chip. I, I know that we didn't actually build anything with tubes in this episode, uh, but we've got this chip here. We, we, we've got a whole lot of really interesting things that we're learning. And we have an idea for a proof of concept that we're going to build. And then once we're happy with the proof of concept, we're gonna go and recreate this actual chip. Uh, but as you saw with our logic diagram, this is not a short project. This is going to take a while. So in the meantime, I'm going to keep playing with this and, and learning the interesting quirks about it. And I want to thank you guys for watching and uh, hopefully I'll see you all in the next episode.